And we're thrilled to have a guest speaker here today, Pamela Jennings. She has a variety of interesting back, uh, elements to her background, which I'm sure she'll tell you about. She's been a program manager at the National Science Foundation, helping lead the creative IT uh, solicitation and research on creativity, as well as cyber learning. Uh, she has also uh, she has her PhD in human-centered systems design uh, from University of Plymouth in the UK, as well as an MFA and her business degree. Uh, she's been spanning all sorts of interesting interactions. So we're thrilled to have her, and please welcome her. Thank you, Stephen, for such a wonderful introduction, and also thank you for the invitation to come here to uh, Iowa State uh, University to give a presentation. This is my first time in the state of Iowa. Although I've traveled a lot, but somehow I've skipped over Iowa, so here I am having the Iowa experience. Great, so my vision is a world where innovative ideas and solutions that support new ways of coexisting in the world are invented, explored, and shared. This is a world that is abundant with new opportunities to integrate the collective opportunities um, of an, and collective intelligences of those who have been systematically absent from the discourse of experimentation discovery and decision-making. Exploring how technology illuminates human paradoxes and augments human potentials has been the driver behind and the foundation of my creative work and research activities. So I'd like to summarize before I start um, the places that are noted of which the work the places that I've worked at and my contributions to the field have impacted. Research, resources, policy, and facilities. And the main question always at the center of that is about access. So to start off with research, I'll give you a little bit of my background. So, the main project that I'm currently working on is called Constructs. It's actually a business startup project, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get into the slides. So Constructs is a 3D model. You're building 3D models with these blocks. And this is an early video taken a couple of years ago. Um, and as you're building with the blocks, you're actually building on a 3D model or rendering a 3D model in re real time as you're actually connecting these blocks in the computer screen. Um, Construct stores the data about players' process and progress during the game play. So here's an image that shows our alpha prototype that was completed in 2008-ish, 9-ish, um, various parts of it, that gives you the overview of what Constructs does in terms of building 3D models and then having basically a, um, I think I do have a pointer here, make sure I don't point it in my own eye, um, the 3D model here on the screen you know, in real time as you're building with the blocks. It's been a really interesting process, actually, de developing this project, and I continue to develop it right now um, under my company, Constructs. It actually started as a re university research project at Carnegie Mellon University, where I was a professor both in the School of Art as well as in the Human Computer Interaction Institute. What's interesting is I started working on this project in my studio at the School of Art, not in the HCI Institute. But I worked with students from about nine different schools and units across the campus over the couple of years I worked on this project. And you see the list of schools there. From art to computer science, architecture, design, drama, electrical engineering, entertainment, um, uh, uh, entertainment uh, center, uh, technology center, um, cognitive science, information sciences. Within my studio in the School of Art was a safe place to explore and experiment for all these students, many of them who had never known each other beforehand, to come together and to work on a project which was completely out of the box for them, um, whether it was out of the box in terms of the forms of collaboration or the way that they were being asked to think about designing the early versions of the systems of Construct. 
And from that, it was a very interesting process as we went through the design iteration. Originally, I wanted to build these out of wood. We had very limited access to the proper facilities to actually build something like this out of wood. Probably still wood today if I was still doing this at CMU. But it was still an interesting process to see what happens when you're coming up with an idea and you're trying to figure out how to make it work. You're coming up with very medium fidelity, low to high to medium fidelity um, models here. Um, to our very first wood prototypes, which very quickly we kind of realized was not the most pra practical um, based upon what we had access to working with. The very first prototypes, these were wood scraps that were pulled out of the School of Design wood shop where I just paste and glued together um, pieces of wood to just try to figure out what it was that I was thinking in terms of how these blocks would work. And then our first actually more 3D model prototype uh, where this was rendered in CAD and output as CAS models. Uh, it worked kind of, <laughs> but it was actually a really amazing learning experience getting to the point you know, of putting this together. Is it as eloquent as the wood? No. You know, but it's interesting what happens in terms of the sacrifices and the changes that you do as you're going through and making this type of structure. Um, here are some stills from the video that I just showed you um, very quickly. They show different ways that people were working with the alpha prototype here in terms of building. This was at an ACM CHI uh, conference in um, Florence, Italy in 2008, I think was the Florence, Italy um, interactive, uh, interactivity showcase. Working with it. So what happens once you take a, a project which started as university research and you try to figure out how to move it toward product? Uh, so currently, I am working on, um, I'm actually in residence in a um, incubator that's focused on hardware startups called Highway One. And what's interesting is that I received funding from the National Science Foundation actually for that alpha prototype and now I'm working on the beta. So I've moved from working with students to working with people who used to be students, right, who are still very interested in terms of um, contributing software and engineering design um, and in industrial design to this project uh, they're working on, as well as working with a product design firm that's in Pittsburgh and a firmware solutions firm, which is in Seattle, Washington. So we have went from experimentation, kind of like what you would say is, um, uh, you know, the, the very basic level of thinking about a project and then starting to move it toward turning it to product. In that process, then we start looking at in industrial design of the project. So this is actually an image from our beta prototype. I'll show you a picture of it soon. But you can see that we start to, you can see the detail that, that happens within this model. And, um, you know, I love these type of exploded diagrams. Um, in short, the way that the blocks work is that they form a Zigbee mesh network for anyone who's an engineer in the audience. So each block is a node on a wireless sensor network. Each block is responsible for its own state in a puzzle, and it then um, sends that, that message to a computer, which takes those messages and untangles them and draws the model, the 3D model. So we start working from, and actually I never did work with um, Arduino on this project, but worked with technologies kind of at that level. We move from that level to actually designing proprietary hardware, um, application hardware um, components uh, for the project, including a part which I actually really love, uh, which is that our connectors are what I like to call gender neutral connectors. In other words, they're not plug and socket connectors. They're magnetic, but they do not repel. Um, they also give a signal to tell which angle the blocks are connected to each other. Um, so that's a little bit of uh, a picture of the secret of the sauce <laughs> behind it. And then our beta prototype right now, where it was funded by the National Science Foundation Small Business Innovative Research Phase 1 program last year, which allowed me to work with many of the same people who I worked with on that earlier prototype of the blocks and moving it toward the beta um, prototype. So when we start talking about resources, I mentioned that I am uh, participating in a hardware incubator called Highway One. They're in San Francisco. It's a four-month program. Started in March, and it culminates in, in June with a big presentation and demo. Um, here you can see the entrance of Highway One. Um, Business startup incubators are becoming very popular, not only in this country, but worldwide. Many of them are focused more on software 
um, applications or products, or web-based products, with an occasional hardware or engineered product that's kind of big in the mix. Whereas Highway 1 is very different. It focuses only on hardware-oriented products. There are 12 companies that are in the class right now um, that I'm sharing this space with. And here you can get a little kind of sense of what our space looks like. Um, the intensity of the work and, and the excitement and the noise of the space as well, both literally and figuratively in terms of the ideas that are being generated um, uh, and developed uh, here in the space. One part of Highway 1 is that Highway 1 is actually connected to a, um, an umbrella company called PCH International. Many people have never heard of PCH International, but many of us have some type of device that has been manufactured by them in China. They're a company from Ireland, um, and they focus basically on, on manufacturing in China. And one part of Highway 1 is that we will travel to China for two weeks in May to actually learn more about the supply chain process that goes on um, with their company um, and to work with the engineers in terms of taking our prototypes and doing what's called a design for manufacturing. And it's a fascinating process that I'm learning right now because ID is not my background. So I'm learning, you know, as I'm stepping through these processes of what really takes to take an idea, you know, that you might have started with Arduino or something like that, and then start to move it toward a design which eventually could be replicated and manufactured to put out tens of thousands, if not millions, you know, of copies of what it is that you're building. So just a little, this is what PCH International um, does. And it's very interesting. It's a really great learning process um, to, to understand the logistics, the supply chain, packaging, fulfillment. Um, it's almost like getting a little MBA within four months, you know, in terms of, of looking at manufacturing. Um, processes. Some people might be aware of a company called Little Bits. Little Bits is actually a company um, that was actually not a Highway 1 company, but it is a PCH International company that went through a similar program that PCH International has um, that called the Accelerator Program. So Little Bits, uh, there's kind of a phenomenon now where there's research that's been coming out of engineering programs primarily to teach children, and sometimes not children, adults, the basics of, of electronics. A lot of this work has come out of MIT Media Lab, and that's where Little Bits came out of as well. So if you're not familiar with this, you have little components, each with a different function for electronics, and you can create various different types of projects. Um, with them and learn about um, electronics and programming. So in terms of my involvement with developing facilities, um, after I left uh, Carnegie Mellon University, I took a post at a place called the Banff Center in Alberta, Canada. If you've never been to Alberta, Canada, I recommend it. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, that is Alberta, Canada, <laughs> or that is Banff, actually. Um, Alberta is much larger than that. Um, and I was running a lab there called the Advanced Research Technology Lab, or other words known as the Art Lab, and a program called the Banff New Media Institute, uh, or the BM BMNI. The Banff New Media Institute had been around for almost a decade, but Banff actually, the Banff Center has been at the foreground of um, integrating arts and design and technology and engineering, probably going back 20, 25 years, is probably one of the first residency um, facilities which had um, infrastructure of 1990 that I would say is on par of the infrastructure that you have here, right? So 1990s, you think about what you have here now, um, and they were providing that type of infrastructure for artists, designers, and engineers to explore. Um, they didn't call it HCI, but a lot of what they were doing was HCI or HCC um, with a very strong creative um, edge to it. So when I arrived at Banff, um, the art lab itself um, had been underutilized for a couple of years before I arrived there. You know, programs have their ebbs and flows, and there was an opportunity here. And as you can see in this room up in the top, this was our main lab, and that's what it looked like when I arrived in Banff. Um, however, the idea and the goal was to create a real design innovation space, a space that would attract the best and the brightest in terms of student interns, which I called research associates rather than interns, as well as faculty and professionals um, who were engaged in the arts, design, engineering, 
um, computer science, and all other types of disciplines which are attracted to um, the synergy of making, um, turning the lab into this type of space. Pretty typical, we invested in 3D printers. Um, actually, the lab itself was known for having a cave, a very early cave, not like the cave that you have here. Um, and um, an early cave with some very early Dell computers still running that early cave. So one of my goals there was to try to figure out how to still work with the 3D, the 3D visualization, but try to start to bring it out of the cave as well in terms of projection space, as well as start to bring things into the lab which many of our contemporary makers are very interested in working with, whether it's rapid prototyping or touch surfaces, um, literally programming, um, applications um, and, and other types of activities as well. So here I show some of the facilities that I just spoke about um, that we had in the lab. Now key to having a lab is actually bringing in really good people to work within that lab. I am only, I was only the facilitator trying to make the space in terms of uh, an, an inviting and engaging space, kind of reminding me of the type of work that I did when I was at CMU, bringing students into my studio to work. And so the first thing that was done was to bring in what I called research associates. So rather than calling them interns or work study, which is the term that Banff used, I wanted to give them a term or give them a title that really was up to par to what their responsibilities and expectations were. We had a very international group of students um, in the lab um, over the year that I was there. You can see the universities that it came from, University of Calgary, Alberta College of Art and Design. We had students from Linz, Austria, Bogota, Colombia, and Hong Kong. Among the projects that the students or my uh, research associates, because they weren't my students, I actually did work with some students at the University of Calgary, but they were not my students, um, worked on. This one is actually a very interesting story, where this disc that David, this is David, is standing on, was originally used in 1990 in the first workshop that Banff did on virtual reality. It was a really important historic work, uh, workshop or, or kind of residency that they did, where they brought in, once again, artist designers and many people who were doing military level research on VR systems. Remember, this is 1990, we're in 2014 right now. So, um, and this was a disc that was used in someone's project, you know, to do something with proprioception and balance. However, when I arrived there, this disc was collecting dust in the back closet, and I recognized it because I actually was in Banff in 1990. Not for that residency, but I was a work study. There. So um, I recognized, and I, was, and I, so I said to, uh, to a couple of the research associates, I said, do something with this. <laughs> you know, so we had a lot of sensors, um, we had um, fidgets, I think is what, what we had, basically just you know, some tilt sensors, et cetera. So very quickly, this was not a long-term project, they probably put this together in a week. <laughs> You know, of course, in Banff, you don't sleep. You kind of, you know, you party and you work. But uh, <laughs> um, this, this fun, it's basic, but it was a fun game, you know, in terms of just trying to balance this ball and to keep it from falling off the edge with your own balance in terms of your own proprioception. Now, we know in HCI, there is quite a bit of research in proprioception. This was not a research project. It was just something, you know, um, to explore and experiment with. Um, we also, like I said, we brought in 3D prototyping. So, and it was a really interesting kind of like approach to 3D prototyping um, because the research associate who did this work, actually this work is Ken Perlin. He was a uh, visiting um, um, artist or visiting faculty in the lab. Um, and this work here, um, Eva was really interested in trying to figure out how to visualize things which are ephemeral which you can't really see. So this is actually a visualization of, of vocal waves, you know, which comes out in this very, very beautiful design. These are small, they're, they're, they're little. You know, perhaps they could be molded into something that would be a much larger sculptural piece. Um, and this came out as a result that there was a visual arts program there, and we went to one of the seminars that they were holding, one of the discussions, and there was the typical conversation about objectivity versus subjectivity, which is kind of like a, um, a conversational and, and debated and philosophical trope of the arts. And we left there and we're like, objectivity, subjectivity. 
creativity. You know, it was kind of like one of those things where there's no real answer. So we thought, well, let's visualize that and see what it means. So actually, this is my voice. But what we did was, since we had so many different languages in the lab, we had people say it in French, in German, in English, in Spanish. And uh, Eva looked at the va various uh, visualizations in the program that she created in processing to be able to visualize those sound waves and then ended up um, spinning this out into a 3D prototype. And then one of, finally, one of the other types of work that also people did in the lab was to really develop their own new computer programming languages, which I think was relatively new for activity happening at Banff. So this project here, it's quite interesting, was done by um, an artist and computer scientist named Travis Curtin. And he actually created a program where you're painting with language. You're actually etching and drawing with language. So this is just a little detail. But what he did was he took the full text of Alice in Wonderland, and then he looked at the original lithographs for Alice in Wonderland, and he traced or redrew those lithographs based upon the literal text from that chapter that those lithographs came from. Um, there's a little detail. These are huge prints. They're actually quite beautiful because if you stand far back from them, you can't see the language. You just see the eloquence of the stroke. And then when you get close to them, you can actually see the words. You know, it's not meant to be able to read the words, but you can actually see the language within the words. And then we also had other research associates who were developing new visual programming languages, sort of like Max MSP, um, languages that are in that, that type of um, category. So resources. So you can't do any of this type of work without access to resources. So I'll talk a little bit about my time at Creative IT um, and uh, my interest there in terms of trying to figure out how to open up or bring more different types of researchers and practitioners into the family of NSF for the potential of being funded for their work. So creative IT, I was what's called a cognizant program officer in the lead, which meant that I, I led this particular program. It was around for about three years. Well, here I tell you some of the other programs I was part of as well. Human-centered computing, cyber learning, transforming education, computer resource infrastructure, all programs I also worked on with other program officers on the team that managed those programs. Um, I advised some other programs as well, like the, the Small Business Innovative Research, uh, with a focus on education technology, and the science is computer information science and engineering broadening participation. And uh, I try to get away from the NSF acronyms, because the whole world doesn't necessarily know them, um, and some other things as well. These federal councils were actually quite interesting. And an incredible opportunity um, as being part of the National Science Foundation. So I was on this one council, the first one, Federal Network Information Technology Research and Development. They're good for really long titles, titles too long. NIDERT, Social Economic and Workforce IT. So what did they do? Uh, basically, every year when Congress and the president are putting forth their budgets for where the money is going to be spent in, in basically research in general. There are federal networks like this, and this was across all of DC, uh, which help to advise and give input and insight to what they think are the trends. Right. So we would put together um, collectively text, which would then be added into the federal budget proposals for Congress then to, um, to vote on. Um, the Federal Council for the Arts and Humanities was really, really interesting. Um, it, uh, surprisingly, it wasn't about necessarily supporting arts and humanities in terms of research, but what they did was there's a program that indemnifies rare art and, and art, um, architectural artifacts that come into the U.S. for exhibition. And um, basically, this was a council that had representatives from GSA, NS, NSF, um, the State Department, <laughs> FBI, you know, um, that basically approved whether or not certain exhibitions should be indemnified, the art should be indemnified, so it could come to the U.S. for exhibition and cut back in terms of the expense, in terms of the insurance. When we're talking about the art, we're talking about Picassos and Degas and, and Warhols and more Picassos and Degas and Warhols. Um, but it was very, very interesting. Gauguin, et cetera. And I'll talk about the NEA, um, um, NSF in a second. Um, so Creative IT program was around from 2007 to 2010. 
Um, in total, across those years, I calculated that it funded approximately $38 million worth of research grants um, in this program area. Um, the main year that I ran the program, $9.5 million were granted. Um, and actually, I increased that budget because originally the budget was only $5 million that they gave me. But by actually soliciting funds internally of NSF in collaborations in terms of other, agent, other um, directorates helping to co-fund, uh, raised that to $9.5 million worth of grants in that time that year. Um, et cetera. Some more statistics are there as well. So our funding platforms to Creative IT were across these four bullet points. Models to understand creative uh, cognition and computation. Breakthroughs in science stimulated through the arts. Innovative educational approaches that encourage creativity. And software tools that support creative problem solving. So just to give you an idea of some of the types of grants um, or projects that were awarded, and I only have two here. We awarded a lot, but there's not time to go through everything. But these are some that I think really show kind of like the, um, the potentials in terms of what can happen when we look at computer science engineering and either the fine performing or applied arts. So here was a project that was done by David Kirsch, who's a cognitive scientist, um, and Wayne McGregor, who is a choreographer from the UK. He's kind of like one of the bad boy post-postmodern choreographers. I'm not sure if that's really a term, but I'm just going to call it. His work is really beautiful, so if you ever get a chance to see it, I highly recommend it. Um, and so they were collaborating on this project called Distributed Creative Cognition and Choreography. And you can see here, um, you, you can see some Wayne McGregor and some of the dancers, but the idea behind here is that students of, um, of Dr. David Kirsch were observing the dancers and they were trying to understand the process of collaborative creative decision making. You know, what happens when there's not necessarily just one person saying, move your hand here, or move your arm here, or point here, but there's a vocabulary that's developed among the dancers, a very fine-tuned vocabulary, and how the decisions that they make um, kind of like just replicate through their process of discovery. Um, very, very interesting work. Um, here's one more of the projects um, that came out of RPI, Creative Artificially innov um, Intuitive Reasoning Agents and Ensemble Music um, Improvisation. It was a collaboration between Jonas Brosh, who's a computer scientist and architect and uh, musician, and Pauline Oliveros, um, who was world renowned, renowned as a, a player and a, fiction, uh, um, a professional of the accordion. Um, in contemporary music, and Selmer brings for, brings forward. I don't think I said his last name correctly. Um, who's a cognitive scientist, and they're really trying to understand what they're called artificial intuition versus artificial intelligence, and looking at the, the the role of improvisation. In this case, improvisational music, and trying to come up with various types of algorithms um, where the computer would intelligently play along with their improvisations, which were very abstract. This is very, very abstract music um, that they were actually creating. So while at the NSF, so the Creative IT program was around until 2010, but I came to realize that there was actually really um, strong, long-term, not a new community, of makers and researchers and practitioners um, that had only just gotten to the point of just starting um, to see the possibilities of working with and integrating some of their work with the National Science Foundation. At the same time, um, uh, there was a uh, deputy, senior deputy director of the National Endowment of the Arts, Joan Shigigawa, who I've known for many, many years, who started her position around the same time that I started mine. And we had some interesting conversations about trying to figure out ways to build bridges between the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Science Foundation. We had really great, great ideas, but sometimes you have to start from the beginning, start the conversation rolling, and actually that conversation is still going on, and, and there are things that are still in percolation from the work that we did. The very first workshop, so one of the tools of NSF when um, they're trying to look at how people are doing their research, how they're thinking, what are the things that are trends, is that they throw workshops. 
there might be people in the audience here who have either participated in workshops or have been PIs in workshops, so you can kind of understand the process. So what we did between the NSF and the NEA is that we threw a workshop at the, the headquarters of the National Science Foundation, which was um, a, a, a space, a location that was very critical for doing this type of workshop. We invited about 60 some odd people um, who were part of the creative IT program, or not necessarily the program, community, didn't mean they all had been funded. Many of them probably hadn't been. Um, and also um, part of the NEA community that bridged um, between the NEA and the NSF, as well as program officers and other people who worked within NSF who were either my colleagues with Creative IT or very curious and interested in this notion of bridging the arts, technology, and science. Sometimes we call this STEAM, especially when we're talking about the education component of the art, technology, and science. And the goal for this workshop was actually to come out with a gap analysis to say, where are we now, where do we want to be, and what are the potentials? Not only in terms of funding agencies and who's funding what, but just in general in terms of the community. And as a result, this, um, this poster was created um, that was pulled in from the workshop. It was a really interesting workshop. It wasn't a typical workshop where you have a couple of people are giving, pre giving presentations and everyone else is sitting and listening, and that's the workshop. It was highly interactive, right? Everyone was expect expected to participate um, in this workshop. And I'll show you some details of this poster in a second, but this kind of gives you the overall kind of view of the discussion um, that continues today. Right? Many of these things are not necessarily solved. The idea is that we have these disciplines, which sometimes live in silos, usually they do, the arts and humanities, science and technology. We have different cultures of knowing, different languages that we're using. Sometimes it describes some of the very same ideas and concepts, right? Um, or at least concepts which are um, parallel to some degree. Um, and then we start to have some who do the interdisciplinary research. You know, who start to come together between these cultures of knowing. Uh, we're, we're engaging diverse approaches, eliciting challenging ideas, and evolving new paradigms. But what happens when that interdisciplinary research? We, we happen upon these challenges and opportunities, which is where the, the main part of our gap analysis fell, a lot of our conversation. So here are our core challenges and opportunities are divergent values, scholarship, educational institutions, 21st century learning, networks of excellence, and then resources. Now, of course, the goal is, is that we make it across this ramp and we get to this land, right, where the silos are no longer there. Well, the silos will be there, right? We, we weren't overly optimistic. Um, but there is a, more of a, um, um, a collective whole and sense. And these banners here are actually the criteria by which the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts review their proposals. Intellectual merit and broader impact for the National Science Foundation and artistic excellence for the National Endowment for the Arts. So just to get a little bit more of a, a close up here, what was really interesting was before, right when we started the workshop, we asked everyone to write down a piece of paper what were the questions they were asking themselves about either their practice, their institution, their fields, um, et cetera. And uh, this is just an example. They actually, the, the answers kind of fill up this part of the poster. But here are some of the questions. How can we tap into the passions of today's youth to provide the 21st century skills and employment? What is the role of arts in complex issues? How can the arts, humanities, um, Arts and Humanities work in service of solving larger problems. How can the structures of organization and educational institutions enable art, science, learning? How can we break down the silos? And how does computing come together with culture? So, as I said, the gap analysis. So, for example, if we look at diverging cultures, we looked at both what was the challenge and then the opportunity. Now, mind you, this is about 60 pages of notes kind of like boiled down into one poster just to get the essence of the conversation. Um, and uh, just to give an example. So the challenge, real and perceived differences in how we validate what we value. 
the opportunity to create frameworks and forums for sharing, discussing, and understanding the differences and the similarities across cultures of knowing. Um, I'll go to educational institutions. The challenge, silos and unlevel playing fields create disparities in resources, infrastructure, and teaching to research uh, ratios between disciplines. The opportunity, write mission statements that promote interdisciplinary pedagogy as a first principle. Resolve silo mentality with sustained dialogues across the institution. Establish 10-year review guidelines that reward experimental collaboration. We had a lot of professors in the group. Collaborate with nonprofit institutions to the benefit of all. So you kind of get an idea of what it was that we were doing and the, the process that we were walking through um, in terms of doing this gap analysis. I'll just look at the challenges. I won't read all the opportunities. Challenge, 21st century learning. There has been enrollment decline in computer science programs while programs that integrate computational thinking and the arts are increasing. Challenge, art, science, technology networks in the US um, tend to be part of the academic clusters. They are vibrant yet close to those outside of the system. And resources, long-term funding, um, institutions, initiatives, print is really small here, it's bigger here. Long-term funding initiatives are needed to maintain U.S. competitiveness in the international art, science, and technology research arenas. And as I noted, then the, the final part of the poster is saying, what is our future state? You know, saying that we're not necessarily going to find the answers to all those challenges to get to the future state, but we need to be aware of them and to um, you know, try to chisel away at them as we can. Um, so we come to the future state. We have cultural heritage and scientific discoveries, play in expressive forms, inquiry and intuition, creativity and innovation, rigor and curiosity, enabling new modes of research that stimulate breakthroughs in the arts, sciences, and technology. So it's interesting, one of the reasons why I did this as a poster rather than as a report, a 50-page report, which is the typical outcome of, of um, workshops like this, there is a report, there's, there's an executive summary report to this, is that as a program officer I came to realize that you get reports and they're fascinating, but you have so much work to do <laughs> that is really hard, unless the executive summary is really written really well to get through them. Whereas this is something that's visual, it's tactile, and it was really interesting to see how receptive, particularly my colleagues within the National Science Foundation were, not only to the process, but to the fact that we had something that was really quick and easy to grasp. Um, they gave them entry into a really fascinating discussion, which then, if they chose, could go deeper into, and to think about uh, how they could continue to carry forth um, with these ideas. So just to end up where I started, I said the places where I've had work and impact in the field include platforms, policy, resources, and facilities. And as it boils down, to me, the most important question is access. And it's not only access to academic departments or to academic institutions, but it's also access to the diversity of the people who we see in the field, from the students to the professionals. And I think it's important that everyone is aware of it, and if they are aware of it, that they act on it. Right? Because what we do is really important and affects our culture and our society, not only here locally or nationally, but internationally and globally. And we're responsible for that, and we need to make sure that the voices that are at the table for decision making, problem solving, solution finding, playing, are as diverse as possible. So, thank you. Thank you. We have questions. We can run a mic to you wherever you are. Questions for Dr. Jennings. Thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, 
what do you view as the real successor to creative IT now that would be um, an opportunity for research and arts faculties in institutions such as this? Sure. So, um, so you know, Creative IT was always designed to be a short-run program, not to become, you know, a, a major. Excuse me. Um, drink my water too fast. <laughs> you know, a, a major long-term sustaining program. However, it's important to know that there continues to be interest in looking at creativity, the role and impact of creativity, and the various sciences that NSF is charged to support. Um, there are certainly program officers who were part of my team and have their own teams as well um, that continue to look at that as well within HCC or Human Centered Computing, within Advanced Science, oh, they changed the name, Advanced um, Informal Science Learning in Education. Um, I think throughout the agency that you can find interest there. What's really important is that. Um, if you're not um, seasoned necessarily in knowing how to approach the National Science Foundation, I have a feeling a lot of people here probably are who are professors, but as students, you know, as you move on into your careers, especially if it's in academia, it's really important to get to know your program officers. Do not hesitate to get to know them, to email them, to meet them, to attend workshops. That's how you build your network. And that way you can start to find out what is like resonating and what's percolating. You know, and you can find the program officers and or the programs which might be the, the best fit or a place for you to um, submit your proposals. Thank you for a great presentation, Pamela. Um, I have uh, noticed sometimes in our university structures, we tend to be somewhat siloed. So the art people don't always come in contact with the designers, come in contact with the engineers and with the writers and things like that. Do you also feel that this is a problem in our funding agency? And if so, how do we get more collaborative funding for social programs and creativity programs because of this siloing? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think that probably many funding entities kind of, whether it's federal or, pri or private, you know, NGOs, et cetera, um, mirror the siloing that we see in the university because we're all resource driven, <laughs> you know, and so those are the structures that get um, developed. Um, I think that there are some really interesting things that are happening if I look at the federal side um, in terms of not necessarily breaking down the silos, but at least trying to build bridges across entities that typically you wouldn't see in terms of collaborating, whether it's projects or funding opportunities. Like I mentioned, a few that were in the National Science Foundation. The National Endowment for the Arts has actually been doing quite a bit of interesting things, which, and I'm not an expert in the NEA, so I can't necessarily tell you programs. They're not necessarily percolating up into their funding programs, but in terms of building bridges across various federal agencies in the DC area and elsewhere, over the past couple of years, the National Science Foundation has been doing some remarkable work, whether it's DOE or uh, Walter Reed, um, a lot of different agencies, et cetera, where they're trying to start to say that creativity is about cognition and it's about how we learn and how we grow and how we exist in the world, right? And, and the arts are a um, uh, very important part, <laughs> you know, of that process. You know, so, so dig around the NEA website and you can see some of the initiatives that are happening on the research side there. Yeah. Thank you for your work and thank you for recognizing the importance and cognitive contribution of the arts. We need that. <laughs> Other thoughts? I want to do a quick poll while we're here. Of, um, so raise your hand if you're in engineering. Okay, raise your hand if you're in design. Uh, and uh, raise your hand if you're in liberal arts and sciences. All right, so this is a great mix right mm -hmm. here in this room, and so I'm grateful for you to bring these people together. And for continuing this conversation, I want to say that if, you, if you're if you a faculty and you have talks that you think, you know, feel free to email me on behalf of HCI and I can help spread it around, or we would love to hear about talks that you have going on that you think we might be interested in. Yeah. 
Any other questions for Dr. Jennings? Ah, if you're a student and you would like to have lunch with Dr. Jennings, she'll be available <laughs> in the VRAC and the Howell, 1620 Howell for lunch. There's a free lunch with Dr. Jennings here for students coming right up. So thank you. Thank you.